Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Research Community Manager for Sage Method Space, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Julianne Cheek and Elise Obi um, to talk about research design. And this is a first of a series of discussions we're going to have on this topic. Why don't you begin by introducing yourselves? Well, I'll go first, since um, you mentioned my name first for that reason. Um, I'm Julianne Cheek. I'm one of the co-authors of Research Design, written with Elise. And we wrote this book because we've been teachers of research for many years, and we are researchers ourselves. And we see common questions and issues facing people that are coming to research design, both for the first time, but maybe after many times. And so we think that discussion of these topics can only help people when designing their research. Yes, uh, and I'm Elisa Urbi, the other author of this book that Julianne mentioned. So let's get started and discuss some of the topics from chapter one. So why do you put the emphasis on designing research rather than a research design. Um, Alyssa, would you like me to take that or would you like to take that? No, you can start I'll and start. I'll fill in. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the fact that when people talk about research design, it gets equated to a fairly static idea of what a research design is. It's a diagram or it's a picture or it's a model mm. or it's a procedure or it's a technique that's static, that's not evolving. Um, that if you follow it step by step, somehow at the end of it, you end up with a doable and credible piece of research. That's not our experience at all, because our experience is that research design arises from designing research, active, active involvement. Most activity required is thinking, thinking about what you're trying to do, why your design looks the way it does and how you can develop your design in such a way that it will be able to achieve the goals of the research. And that is addressing the questions that you have about whatever it is that you want to know something about. Mm. Yes, so I think that this emphasis is on the, the process of designing research instead of the final research design, like the mm -hmm. outcome of the process. Right, yeah, so I mean, thinking yeah. about a, a holistic kind of iterative process rather than the kind of final document you might be submitting, which, you know, even if you are submitting something for review, um, there are things we need to continue to think about and evaluate as we go. So in your chapter one, you included a diagram of the process that is um, circular um, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about this and, and how you ended up with this uh, diagram to show the process? Um, what we've got in chapter one is the site, a, a figure 1.1 of the cyclic thinking throughout the process of designing research, which, as you say, is iterative. And that means that what we have to do is we have to think about what we're trying to look at, why we mm -hmm. want to look at it, how we might look at it, what does that mean, and then return to our thinking. If we do it that way, does it mean that we will be able to answer the question that we had? What will be the implications mm -hmm. of that? Why it might need to change, et cetera, et cetera. So there is cyclic thinking throughout this whole process mm -hmm. of designing research. It's not like go and pick a design out of a textbook or once I've decided this is my question, then I just write down the method, then I can go and do it. I do the analysis. It's all done. Thank you very much. Done and dusted. Right. Put away. There's a lot more to it than that. Hmm. And then the circular diagram that we actually ended up putting in at the end of the book because uh, it didn't make sense before we had written the whole thing. And that's a circular diagram trying to capture this iterative process of designing research. And then we connect all the major areas of mm -hmm. the research design with double-headed arrows to sort of try to reflect that 
all areas are interconnected and mm -hmm. what you do in one area will affect your thinking in other areas and the circular shape is to indicate that this is not a linear process mm -hmm. yeah so and i think it's a very important point janet that elisa made that there's two different diagrams we're talking about with iterations mm -hmm. and circles in them one is the process of designing and the other one is what we call putting all the thinking together, and that's what we mm. call research design. And as Elise is saying, that in itself is not a static thing. It's constantly shifting and moving as we go through our thinking. Once we've landed on what we think our design is, then, yes, we move through certain processes. It's not a free-for-all. But without the thinking, it's no more than technique rather than research right, design. right. But that's what keeps it exciting and interesting and why we learn so much when we do qualitative research. So you, you identify one of the areas of this process as working with literature. Um, what do you mean by working with literature? Well, literature is used to support the development of research design. So it's only useful from the point of view of how are we actually going to use this to inform the way that we think about our process of designing research. So there are various stages that we would use literature. One is to give us an idea, once we get an idea of what we're interested in having a look at, what's been done before, who's done what, what do we know about this area, what are some of the issues that have been identified, etc. It's about situating or locating the research because no research occurs in a vacuum. There is mm -hmm. always research that has gone before. There is also research that connects into it. Also, you work with the literature at various stages throughout the project. The next stage where you work with it is once you've decided, well, this is my area, then you think, what part of that area do I really want to know something about? And you go into the literature and look at that again. So this is in the area of what we call the substantive area. You know, what is the substance of the project? What is the focus of the project? And it's the empirical work. That is the scientific work that has something to say about that area. But after that, there are other types of literature. And I don't know if you want to come in here, Elisa, about like the methodology literature, stuff like that, et cetera, that we use after that. I think it's really important when reading about a research that other people have done related to the research that you're about to design to also notice how those things have been uh, researched on before you and it might be mm -hmm. that you will discover that people have done research that is related to what you you want to do but they mm -hmm. have done it in like very specific ways and maybe your take on this is slightly different maybe you want to research this using a whole different approach and then you will have to justify that using the literature adding to the existing literature and that is also working with the literature you're not simply reading it just to know what others have done before mm -hmm. you but you think about that literature and that informs your decisions throughout the process of designing your research. Yeah. Right. So, so I, th I think a lot of, uh, especially new researchers, think about the literature as being kind of the 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 what question. You know, what did they study? You know, did they study this kind of problem or this kind of setting? But it's also the how and the why. You know, how was it done? You know, what was the motivation for that study that, that can you know, help you to either differentiate what you're doing or to uh, build on or even to reject, you know, what those those other researchers have done. I think um, I think the other issue here also is that people think that interviews are really easy to do, for example, or that sending out a survey and collecting some quantitative data is a really easy thing to do, but it's actually quite sophisticated and very difficult because your study is only going to be as good as the information you get. And so there's a whole literature about survey development. There's a whole literature about interviews. Mm -hmm. There's a whole literature about focus groups. There's 
literature about these things and about analysis and interpretation and description and differences between them, often this is overlooked. You really need to begin thinking about how you're going to analyse what you find, not about what you think you're going to find, but when you, how are you going to analyse what you actually do find as you are designing your project? So thinking mm. about that is as much a part of your research design as a question and picking a method. And I think all the way along the literature can help and support us um, on the way through. And people, when we talk about literature, as Elisa says, inevitably they think about they're going to do some sort of literature search. They're going to come up with studies that have been done in the area. And as you said, that's it. That's the what. But they forget about, well, yeah, we've got the what, but then how are we going to do this and why are we going to do it in that way? That mm. has to be justified and the literature can help in that regard. So in, in your diagram of the process uh, of designing research, um, you talk about ethics, rec reflexivity, and responsibility around all of these uh, facets of design. So uh, could you talk a little bit about you know, why you've uh, chosen to um, put these different parts together? Lisa, do you want to kick off on that one? We put it around the major areas of a research design to indicate that uh, reflexive thinking and being a responsible researcher and also ethical thinking ethically is it permeates the whole design um, and it should always, you should always think of this as an, like an integral part of every design. And we're going to come back to ethical uh, thinking in a different episode, but what we are trying to indicate by putting ethical thinking around the major areas of the research design in that diagram at the end of the book, we find we find that we want to say that ethical thinking is not only about the formalities, is not only mm -hmm. about like getting informed consent. It permeates the entire process of designing research, and it also permeates the process of putting that design into practice. And the same with reflexive thinking and being a responsible researcher. And what it also means, Janet, is that every part of these things connect, like it's difficult to do ethical research without the reflexive thinking that's required in order to make the decisions about what is or is not ethical in any situation. And that is part of being responsible. So once you start, they are connected without reflexivity, there can be not responsibility, there cannot be perhaps ethical, you know, there's questionable ethics if we're not thinking about what we're doing and reflecting on it mm -hmm. these things help us in terms of the overall design and every part of the project is a result of that for example in one of the circles that we've got there we say we make explicit our assumptions about things by using responsible reflexive and ethical processes of thinking it, I think the thing a key point in in the first part the first chapter of the book is that what designing research about is about is making explicit the thinking that sits behind the choices and decisions that result in the thing called a research design. The research mm -hmm. design is a static representation of the dynamic thinking that sits behind that design. And too often we only focus on the static representations. We do not get into the thinking that has gone underneath that. And what we need to do and what we encourage our students to do is to emulate this responsible ethic, ethical and reflexive thinking as they design their research so that they become responsible, ethical and um, reflexive researchers. So for us, it's impossible to separate those three things from the process of designing right. research. And that's why they surround the entire process of designing research. Is there anything else you would like to highlight from chapter one? I think it pretty much covers the major 
uh, points we are making in the first chapter of the book. Don't you agree, Julianne? Yes, uh, and I think, you know, I would like people to think about why did we put a diagram of what we think research design is in Chapter 11 and not in Chapter 1? I mean, that's an interesting question for our audience to think about and reflect on. Um, and there was a reason, and that is it's the one that Elise said, because until we know what designing research involves, et cetera, it is really impossible to capture that process in a way that makes sense. Reading that diagram cold without the discussion that went before it, you see a diagram, but we hope that the book and our talks, these podcasts and so forth will bring that alive. It's to make that diagram alive. And so at the end, we have a static representation of a very lively discussion, hopefully. Well, thank you for uh, joining me to, to begin this series. And we hope for those who are watching, um, you'll join us for the other episodes that will uh, include a range of topics related to research design and the book by this title.